Hey guys, Kieran here. Uh, just before you watch this video I have with Lucas breaking down Chen Pao, just want to let you know there's another video on my channel where I play games with Chen Pao and I kind of go through a lot of scenarios, mainly sequencing scenarios or like checkmate boards. Uh, they're kind of like puzzles where you can pause the screen and try to solve yourself. So after you watch this video, recommend watching that video as well, testing out what you learned about Chen Pao and seeing how you do. Uh, also, super open to feedback on this format of deck breakdown. Let me know what you guys like uh, about having guests, about the slides, about going to the matchups, maybe the board states. Uh, yeah, this is my first deck breakdown I've made, so really excited to get some feedback and let me know what you guys think in the comments. But without further ado, I'm going to kick it off to the Chen Pao Guide. Hey everyone, Kieran here, joined by a very special guest, fresh off his top 8 from Pittsburgh, my good friend Lucas Singh. And we're going to walk you through the ultimate way to play Chen Pao. The correct way to play Chen Pao. Welcome, Lucas. Do you want to do a quick introduction? Uh, hi, my name is Lucas Zing. I'm a player from Toronto, Canada. I've been playing Pokemon for about seven years now. And yeah, I love Chen Pao. I just came off of getting seventh at Pittsburgh. And I'd love to teach you guys how to play this deck. Sweet. Yeah, so just to get started, like I think it would be kind of cool to talk about how we built this version of Chen Pao. I think it's a little different than the normal version. Uh, we focus more on the turbo, like the Bibril. Um, so just to start off, like what I was going to play for NAIC was this deck. I put a lot of time working in it on it with my friends, Jeremy Gibson, Arjun Kadze. And we were kind of focused on playing Mew. We had Trekking Shoes at the start. We have Kyogre here, Luminion, a bunch of different attackers. Uh, but what we were finding is you were losing games where you don't get Bibril set up. And you're losing a lot of games when you start with something like Kyogre or Luminion. Um, so kind of going to Worlds, we tested the deck a lot. We tried four Trekking Shoes. Um, we tried no Bibril. Uh, but I think you and I both discovered that Bibril is the key to the deck. Uh, so this is kind of the list I played at Worlds. Um, it basically focuses on just setting up Bibril every game. And if you can get to a board state where you have a Buxcalibur and a Bibril, like you should win uh, every game. Uh, so yeah, Luz, what do you think about this build of Chen Pao with the Bibril, how it functions, all that stuff? So yeah, as you said, we went through a lot of like variations of the deck. So I actually also played, thought about playing to NAIC, but different build. I had like two Luminions, two four Seal Stones, it was really wacky. And we just went through a lot of like uh, trial and errors to figure out the most optimal way to play the deck. You know, we had the 1-1 one, one stars in at one point, four Dragon Shoes, like you said. But honestly, like... The main reason why Barrel is so good is just because like your hand always goes to like such a low amount that you just need to replenish it. And you're also very scared of Iono and like Iono Path from Giratina. And Giratina was going to be a really big deck at World, so I think you had to put the 2 Barrel for the deck to be good. Yeah, uh, 100%. And then going to Pittsburgh, I think we only made a one card change. This is your list now. We cut the third back Scalibur for a heavy ball. Um, I don't know, what are your thoughts? Do you think that's a change you'd still keep uh, or anything else? Honestly, I don't know why we didn't have Heavy Ball in the deck originally, because Prizing Ninja is actually so game-losing. I think, like, I was just coping really hard on the fact that, oh, like, I'm not going to prize <laughs> it, or Heavy Ball is just bad, I don't need it. And I actually kind of worked out Rose because, like, I didn't really prize Ninja, but I definitely would keep it. It's a very good card. At Pittsburgh, I used it a lot. Uh, it saved my ass many times from, like, prizing Greninja, or just getting my third Chen Pao game my second be do it's been it was very useful at this point, so i keep that yeah for sure uh i think my logic of not playing heavy ball was it's kind of hard to naturally draw the card like you kind of have to irida for it and like if i'm irritating for heavy ball like do i really have time to do that uh and the odds of prizing greninja was i think it's around like nine percent if you play one copy of a card so then i'm like oh like i'll probably have like two or three turns to draw out of the prizes but uh i definitely lost some games at worlds to greninja being prized so i'd probably keep that as well uh yeah so moving on, I think the most unique thing about how we play Chen Pao is we do not like the V-Stars in this deck. Um, why don't you give your take on why we don't play V-Stars first, and I'll give my opinion. So the main reason we don't play V-Stars is just because two retreat is really, really bad in this deck. At Worlds, I didn't play the 70 HP Freight because I thought starting it was actually game losing. And at Pittsburgh, I kind of reevaluated that, and I was like, okay, it's worth playing it. But I still feel like having two prizes in your deck is actually just a, a terrible starter. There's so many times you just need to retreat to Chen Pao and find two waters. Um, another reason why is because we didn't feel like it was very useful. Especially Palkia. Palkia is almost like always useless. I don't know why anyone would play it in the deck. Arceus does have some merit because it allows you to pull off the turn 2, double cross with your Cologne play more often. But 
the issue we've had with that was that you'd fall off really hard late game, and then you just have an Arceus on your bench. Yeah. Yeah, I think the main thing is that, like, the resources you commit to making an Arceus or a Palkia, like, you can also just commit the exact same resources to a Bibril, which I just think is stronger, and, like you said, you can use Arceus mainly to, like, get that uh, turn two cross switcher cologne. Uh, but, like, honestly, like, the main matchups you need that, like, Gardevoir, for example, like, you have the whole game to do it. Um, and it's also just, like, a two-prize liability on your bench. Like, there's a lot of matchups where, like, you don't want a Chen Pao in play, you only want one in play. So, I don't know, overall, I just, I don't think the deck needs it. Like, if you get set up with the bib rolls, like, your deck is usually so thin by the end, like, you're gonna hit whatever you need. Uh, yeah, so, like, moving on, uh, I think there's some cards that we've had in the deck in testing, like, cards we still talk about and be adding sometimes. The first one I want to talk about is Wishy Washy. So I think you played this one at World. So like, why don't you yeah, go over this, over this card? It's a it's a funny card. Like looking at it, it is like kind of jokes having this in your deck. And I didn't. I don't. It wasn't useless, but it didn't get um, a ton of like utility out of it at Worlds. It had some niche moments where if you needed a one prizer to attack, because there are times where you want to use a one prizer to attack, and Wishy Washy filled that role, but and overall, for the deck, I don't think it's very necessary. For you to do a lot of damage, you do have to commit a lot of energies to it. And at the end of the day, 180 HP is a lot for a one prizer, but it's still like not that much where I think it's worth playing. And I found that you could just attack with Max Caliber most of the time. Like Buster Tail, the attack Max Caliber has, 130 is does the job usually. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think I agree with that. Like, I just think it's not a very efficient attacker to do big damage. And like, it's only really main matchup to use it against is basically just Lost Zone. Um, so yeah, I agree with that. Cool, another card I think we both talked about is the Kyogre. So uh, that was in the NAIC build of the deck. So the main reason Kyogre is really strong is against decks like Lugia. It gives you like a single prize uh, Pokemon that's capable of knocking out things like Luminion, Squawk Ability. Um, it's also decent against stuff like Lost Box or Gardevoir because like you can attack the active with this attack uh, while conserving energy. But for me, I just think that the three retreat is just like so heavy. Like if you start this thing, like it's just like super annoying. Um, a lot of times, like you don't have bench space for this or a way to like kind of put this in the flow of the game. Uh, I don't know. What are your thoughts on Kyogre? I think it really only helps the Lugia matchup. And while that matchup is actually one of our closer matchups, I still feel like um, the, the marginal benefit of putting Kyogre is very low. Like, I feel like if we do have it in our deck, it would increase our Lugia win rate by, like, maybe 5% at most. So, it's not mm -hmm. worth the trade-off of just having an absolutely terrible starter in every other matchup. Yeah. Uh, I think it might increase Lugia, to be honest, by, like, 10 to 15%. So, like, if you play in a meta with, like, a lot of Lugia, like, yeah, I'd put this card, but, like, yeah, like, like you said, it doesn't increase your other matchups enough to, to really play this. Cool, and then the other card, I think you and I both love this card, the Trekking Shoes. Um, I just think it's a great card, like, in almost every deck, if you can fit it. Uh, it just, like, helps a lot with consistency, and it combos really well with Pokestop in this deck. Uh, the problem is we just, like, could not find spots for it. Like, this deck is super tight. Um, we'd have to cut some of, like, our other tech cards, like the Colognes, or, like, a Bibrol, or uh, the Second Rod. Um, but I do think it helps the deck's early game a lot, which is one of this deck's, like, biggest struggles. Um, so I'm not super opposed to playing a build with the Trekking Shoes. What do you think? Yeah, this is this is the G-Shen idea. <laughs> Grand Shen, shout out to him. He loves the shoes. And I really did like them a lot at 1.2, but it just feels like too much for the deck. Like, there's just absolutely no space. You need all the extra cards to help you win. Yeah. And I think you just have to take the gamble that you'll be able to set up without them. But it, you're right, it does really combo really well with uh, Pokestop, like more items, and this is like just digs through your deck faster. But there really is no space for the deck. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give a shout out to a local Tyler Anner. He was the first guy to play Trekking Shoe Pal. Inspired this. <laughs> cool. So just like to, at a high level, we've kind of like talked about the deck a bit. Just to go over what I think the strengths and the weaknesses of the deck are. So like, like one of the big strengths is that Chen Pal is like uncapped damage. Like V Maxes, Vs, whatever it is, like you can knock them out in one shot. Uh, like, Shivered Shell is just a great ability early game. It's basically, like, draw two cards. Um, and this deck uses Greninja, like, super well as an attacker. So, like, Moonlight Shuriken, like, one of the strongest attacks, normally taking two prize cards. So when you combo that with the Cologne, uh, you have a lot of favorable prize trades. Now, once this deck gets set up, it's pretty low maintenance. You have a Bib roll, like, you just literally need to draw, like, one item usually every turn. Like, a Super Retrieval, or you get the Pokestops, whatever you need. Um... But why don't you go over some of the weaknesses of this deck and what's kind of holding this back from really being a tier one deck? 
So the early game is definitely uh, an issue for the deck. Um, you kind of need a lot to get going. You need your rare candy backs. You need Val VIP past turn one. You get a lot of energies in play. So having a suboptimal start will actually kill this deck a lot. Um, yeah, you need the barrels a lot. You need to get your max calibers out. So it is a lot to ask for. Um, if you don't, especially if you don't have an Irid on your hand. Yeah. Other thing is Chen Pao does have. Well, it has a really high damage output. It's actually low HP and. Um, and honestly, like, if you kind of, like, start bad or have a slower start, it's really hard for you to come back in the game, because the main, like, way you win is just by uh, outpacing your opponent with, like, huge damage every turn, so it's really hard to come back from a point where, you know, like, you're down one, two, or three prizes, and uh, sometimes it just feels, like, unwinnable. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Like, uh, yeah, like, Chum Pass is so easy to knock out. Like, that thing's never surviving once you attack with it. Uh, and, like, a lot of times you need to, like, Greninja to get back in the game. So, yeah, like, definitely I'd just say this deck's biggest weakness is just setting up. Like, it's a stage two deck. You play multiple evolutions. Uh, that's just kind of how it is. Uh, cool. So let's let's move into the matchups guide. Um, I kind of have here at a high level uh, my thoughts on the matchup. So I'd say one of the main reasons to play Chen Pao is it has a fantastic guard of our matchup. Like, you should win almost every round versus that. Um, and then some of the, like, tier 1, tier 2 decks, like, it has a decent matchup into, like, Maraidon, I'd say it's good against, like, Lugia, I'd say you're slightly favored. Any Arceus deck, I'd say you're favored. Charizard, you're definitely favored. Um, but, like, the thing that's kind of, like, holding Chen Pao back, I think, besides his consistency, is it has a pretty bad matchup to Lawson. Um, what do you think about these, its matchup spread? I think Gardevoir is, like, actually, like, if you draw, like, semi-well against Gardevoir, you'll win almost all the time. Uh, I hit the match with Roulette at Pittsburgh. I hit six Gardevoirs, and I beat all six of them. It was just a wash. Um, so I think that matchup's amazing. And especially with Charizard getting more popular now, too, like, that matchup is actually fantastic. I actually think that matchup is, like, unironically like a 90-10. <laughs> like, I don't see myself ever losing that matchup unless I just absolutely break. Uh, Dumbreon is not really a deck that like deck anymore, but that was kind of a concern, like a big going into Worlds because they have the outs to Lost City, uh, your yeah your Excaliburs, but that's not really an issue. Um, I think one thing that I think about is the Tita matchup. I think the Tita matchup, wow! If you, I think if you get two Barrels out, the matchup is even to favored. But getting only one or zero, I feel like you're slightly unfavored. And if you're at zero, then it's a bad matchup. Yeah, I'd agree with that, too. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I mean, we're going to talk about that later. Um, but yeah, just to start, let's start off with Gardevoir then, like the deck's best matchup. Um, so like, honestly, like what you want to do against Gardevoir is you're kind of like building towards that like, canceling clone play with the Greninja. Um, you're normally taking out like two Curlias, or, like a Arcana Gardevoir and a Curlia. Um, and you have almost the whole game to really do this. Like... Assuming, like, you take the first prize with the Chen Pao, like, even if they knock you out back, like, it's fine to trade one prize, one prize, because eventually the board state's just going to be, like, they have one prize left, you have two. Um, you can either cross switch your guard bar with Chen Pao, or you can pull off the clone play. But if you're able to pull off a clone play early, uh, you basically just, like, destroy this deck. Like, they have no draw engine. Um, you know, the other thing I said is, like, try and set up two barrel if you can. Uh, one is fine, but... This deck's gonna like keep Ionoing you. Like you literally every turn just need like an attacker and like energy. Uh, and under what I put like what not to do in this matchup is you don't want to bench multiple Chen Pao, giving them multiple uh, two prizes. Um, I said it's okay here if you're trading with a Zacian. as long as you're trading two for two, it's it's fine. Um, do you have anything else to add to this matchup, or do you think that more or less covers it? Um, I think I have something to add on the Guard War side, not really the Chen Pao. Sure, let's hear it. Quite well. I think that for the Guard of it, the ways you can win this matchup is, um, you know, just like spam Iono, keep your collapsed. Collapse is very important in this yeah. matchup because you need to collapse away your Guard of War EX. Um, Cresselia is very important in this matchup because Cresselia can't actually go through the, the baby Vidoof's ability. So I think for the Guard of War, usually, I think this matchup in percentage wise is like 70 30. Yeah. And it's just like, if you ever pull off the turn two cross your clone, it's like the game's almost always over. And like you said, you have the entire game to do it, so it just feels like so favored. Yeah. Like, I just, like, I'm never scared of losing this match. Yeah. I'm so I, happy to hit guard of Yeah. Yeah, like, I'd say, like, too, like, the one way you can lose is, like, if you tunnel too hard on, like, getting greedy for that cross switcher clone play, like, too early, like, I think you can lose. But, yeah, like, as long as you get set up, this matchup should be kind of unlosable. Cool, so let's move on to Maraidon. So, like, this deck's been picking up a lot of steam lately. 
Um, and honestly, like, this is just a trading one shot back and forth kind of deck. Um, but, like, to me, like, the reason I think this matchup's actually pretty good is, like, they're only going to be knocking out your Chen Pals, like, two prize attackers. So, like, I put this in all caps. Like, as long as you do not bench a Chen Pao going first, you're always going to win the prize trade. Because they're going to knock you out, like, a Raikou, Maridon, whatever. And then you can respond with the Chen Pao. Uh, so you'll be at four, they'll be at five. If they want to knock out your Chen Pao, they have to respond with a V. And then you just go back and forth with Chen Pao's. Um, some things to keep in mind is like if they play path, like make sure you're saving your stops and vacuums. And if you see them playing the flying Pikachu VMAX, just make sure you save your escape rope just to get out of that. Like you can combo with cross switchers while take prizes. Um, yeah, that's what I think. Lucas, anything to add on that matchup? So I think um, you're right about not benching Chen Pao because they're really fast, so they can get an early kill, especially. Uh, and it's like a free two prizes. But I actually, because I played in this round when I at Pittsburgh, and the way I played it was I used Greninja a lot, actually. Mm -hmm. So Greninja is very important because it kills the Flaffy, and I would also put 90 on like whatever the attack with whether it be like a Raikou or Maridon, and Buster Tail, uh, the attack on Max Caliber actually kills with that, with that math, so it actually works out really well. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a good point, to be honest. Yeah, like, I think it's just all about making sure the prize trade is just, like, always in your favor. So, like, given the example you gave, so, like, let's say you knock out a Flaffy, put 90 on, like, a Maridon or something, if they knock out your Chen Pao, just don't bench another one, knock it out with, uh, like, Backscalibur or something, and then bench something new. Cool. So I kind of have here, like, your ideal board turn one. Um, this is if you go first or second. Like, this is kind of like the board you like to see. Um, at least two Frigid backs so they can't boss or rope or whatever. Knock it out. Then you just have two Bidoofs, like you're going to sacrifice one of them as a single prizer. Um, and then obviously you're going to draw. Cool, so let's move on to Lugia. I think the Lugia matchup's a little similar to the Maradon matchup. I'd say I, this one's a little trickier, just because they have some single prize attackers. Um, so do you want to walk us through how you think this matchup plays out, what you should be doing? So Lugia feels like very... Um, not iffy, but there's definitely like ways where you can lose over time in control. It's similar to Maridon, where if, uh, if you go second, you, uh, you do absolutely do not bench a uh, Chen Pao. You just never want to bench a Chen Pao. And it's just like, you'll lose the game if you bench a Chen Pao by starting second. But going first, I feel like this matchup becomes very good because yeah. um, just like you'll hit the, if you hit the turn two backs, turn two backs is very important in this matchup. Uh, I think if you whiff the turn two backs, you'll usually far too behind to come back in this game. Uh, other than that, I feel like it's actually pretty variable if you just like draw well, which is like, kind of like the entire point of the deck. Yeah. yeah, I think yeah, most of these matchups, like Lugia and Maradon, if you're missing turn two attack with like Backscalibur, I think you're probably going to lose. Uh, one other call out I have is, it's a niche scenario, but if you're able to, like going second, um, if you're able to get a Greninja to attack without a Chen Pao, you can put 90 on two Archeops, and if you can super out it next turn and put it back, uh, you can knock out both their Archeops, and like, you'll pretty much always win the prize trade that way as well. Um, so yeah, so like, if you're going first in this matchup, I think Chen Pao's actually fine, like, you want it, because you want to take a knockout turn two. Um, if they put, like, a single prizer in the active, like, try and cross switch your their Lugia, if you can't, just knock it out with, like, Backscalibur or something. Um, and then if you're going second, it's the exact same board as the Maridon board. Make sure your Chen Pao's not down. Um, if their hand is, like, kind of weak, like, they only have a few cards, like, you know that they're probably not going to be able to, like, boss, evolve, get all the V-Stars... I think it's fine to put Chen Pao on your bench if you have to, because you need to promote it, use its ability. But in general, if you can get this board state, I think you're in a pretty good spot against Lugia. Cool, so let's move on to Mew. Uh, I think this is a deck where, or a matchup where it's all just about setting up. Um, you do trade pretty favorably with them, um, but it can be annoying. Like, they play Judge Path, they have a single prize attacker, Meloetta. Um, Genesect is actually a great attacker against Chen Pao as well. Um... I know you played against this deck in top eight too. What do you think about the Mew matchup with this deck? I actually, I, I, I don't quite like the Mew matchup. Um, the one three two prize line is very, like, very easy to do with this yeah. deck, especially because you go Greninja, ninety on Aloetta, ninety on a UV Max. It's so soft and up, so you only need four energies on Chen Pao. And if your Mew opponent doesn't play it correctly, I feel like it's very favored. Yep. They'll usually fusion. I like, usually use a lesser sparkle and attach a fusion energy to their Mew, which is incorrect. You want to attach it to the Genesect, um, which is what my top eight opponent did. But he actually got really unlucky because he poke stuffed away his last three. Energies. <laughs> but yeah, I actually think if they play it well, it becomes a lot closer. But uh, most players won't play it well, to be honest. Yeah, I think one thing to call out as a, a Mew player is 
if you're going first and you actually can knock out a Chen Pao before your opponent takes a prize, you actually do not bench Malawetta. Like what you want to do is you want to at least a sparkle to a Genesect, uh, take your first knockout with a Mew, and when they knock out your Mew with their Chen Pao, you want to at least a sparkle again and take the knockout with the Genesect. And as long as you don't put a Mew VMAX in play, the Chen Pao player actually cannot uh, win the prize trade. And on the Chen Pao side, I put here in the what to do section, uh, you can let them take two prizes before you have to take a knockout. So normally what happens is they'll knock you off the Malawetta, you're going to respond with the Greninja, they're going to respond with a Mew, and then from there you just have to go Chen Pao, Chen Pao. Um, as long as you really set up like a big roll, like you should be fine. Like you literally just have to draw like a super retrieval and a couple energies. Um, so yeah, this matchup's just about setting up pretty much. And against Fusion Mew, they don't play a lot of disruption. So uh, yeah, once that one path is gone, you're usually like chilling. Cool, let's talk about Rapid Strike. So Rapid Strike's always a deck, like, I hate playing against it just because, like, I feel like if they high roll set up, like, it's annoying for you, but this deck's also kind of like a pile. Um, so some of the tips I put is, especially if you're going first, like, always try to KO their Remoraid with your Greninja. Um, this deck's like a combo deck. They always need to be getting pieces. So if you can, like, kind of take that out, that's good. Um, if you can, try and get two backs Calibre set up. Like, you just basically don't want your board to be vulnerable to the... Yoga Loop, knock out both your um, Backscaliburs. Then the other thing too is like, if you see that the Yoga Loop play is coming, um, if you can leave three energy on a Chen Pao, like, it actually doesn't matter if uh, both your Backscaliburs get knocked out, since you can just attach one more and then knock out their Metacham, or if they have a Lumineon or something on the bench, you can do that. Um, and then just be cognizant of also just like, what you're benching, like, if you're playing into the Yoga Loop play, like, if you have a Manaphy, like, you probably want to put it down eventually, but you have to make sure it's at a time where it's as hard as possible for them to pull off the play. Um, I don't know, Lucas, do you have anything to add to this matchup? Um, not directly to this matchup, but something you brought up is like the three energies on Chen Pao. I think this deck uh, has the capability of putting checkmate boards a lot. Yeah. And we haven't really touched on that yet, but the deck has the capability where, you know, a lot of ways your opponent can win is like maybe bossing your backscaliber, you don't really have a way to get more energies in play or something like that on the lines of that. So just like overloading your board with energies to force the knockout on Chen Pao is usually a very good play you can make because getting those energies back are really easy, but getting on rare candy backs again is kind of hard. Yeah, I think that's a great point. So yeah, let's kind of talk about like here. So I kind of said this is the ideal board. Like kind of what you're talking about is, uh, like let's say this is your board, it's just fresh. Like it probably won't be fresh of no damage, but like let's say your opponent like gets the nuts. They like yoga loop your mana fee, they knock out both your backscalibers. Like, since if you preemptively left energy on the Chen Pao in play, um, you can do the knockout like Lucas is saying. And there's a lot of matchups where, for example, I think Lost Zone especially is like, you can't afford to bench Frigibax, like, after you already have a Backscalibur since it's just a free prize with Sableye. So you need to kind of, like, be aware of, when am I at risk of my Backscalibur getting knocked out? Um, and can I set up a board state where I don't need it again? So maybe, like, normally what I do is I'll put, like, two energy on a Greninja, two on a Chen Pao, um, if they knock out your Chen Pao, it's fine. You can you still have Backscalibur, you just bring it back. Uh, if they knock out your Backscalibur, you have your Greninja ready. So, yeah, like, this deck is, like you're saying, very good at checkmates in the sense that uh, you can play around Boss, you can play around Iono. So that's definitely something to be super cognizant of. I'm glad you called that out. Cool, so next up, let's talk about Lost Tina. Uh, I think this is probably one of the most popular decks in the meta. Um, I think we debate people a lot how the Chen Pao matchup is for this one. So why don't you go through this matchup and how you think it should be played? Yeah, so I think you and Grant too both think this matchup is fine. I don't think this matchup <laughs> is that fine. Um, it's very scary because I always feel like I'm winning because you'll almost always get fed a free two-prize knockout because they'll always miss seeking. So you feel like you're ahead, you'll go three prizes and then boom, rocks that path and you lose the game. So I really hate this matchup to be honest. But I do think that our build has the best matchup into this deck. 2-2 two -two Vivero is very important because it doesn't. Allow, if you get both out, it stops your phone from using Sableye, Roxanne Path, and just like completely limiting your hand. So I think just getting two Viveros out is very important. The 70 HP Frig is very important in this matchup. Um, just optimal thinning, hold your stops, hold your vacuums. It's just probably like the best way you can win this matchup. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, I think like you're saying, if you get a 2 2 Bibro, like you're not losing because like you're kind of immune to Roxanne Path. Um, but like, let's say you have an awkward game, you can only get one set up, or you don't have one in play. Kind of like how we're talking about before, like setting up your board, uh, leave extra energy in play. Um, if you're getting Roxanne, you're not getting bossed, so you know you don't have to worry about your uh, Backscalibur going away, you don't have to worry 
you know, something is stuck in the active. Um, like normally, like what I do is I just leave two energy on an active Chen Pao. So if they do Roxanne and Sableye, like I have a knockout on their Sableye. Um, and like you said, try your best to like leave Pokestops in the vacuum in the deck. Um, but again, this matchup's just about setting up. Cool. So like, yeah, I kind of like talk about like this is kind of like what you want to build towards if you can. Uh, get those Vibrils out, have the Backscalibur. Ideally two, but if you just have uh, one, make sure you're evolving the 60 HP for your backs. Um, the 70 HP one's just like better. If you have a Bidoo for whatever, for whatever reason, they can't knock them both out with Sableye. Um, so yeah. Uh, As, uh, one more thing to talk about, Tina. Yeah, let's so go I, I think some of you might be questioning why there's a Vanity on this board. And I actually think that uh, we don't need a Bench Vanity in this specific matchup. Most of the Lost Box matchups, you do need a Bench down. To, so your board doesn't get wiped, but Tina is such a slow deck that you don't really care. That like it's just so hard for them to Greninja. And another thing is a lot of Tina lists are actually cutting Manaphy now, so I think the matchup actually has got better because yeah. now um, you can get like a free two prizes pretty easily. Yeah, I think another call out too is that like if they start using Iona or Roxanne, like if you just Greninja and take out their Confies, like they're actually gonna have trouble to draw late in the game. Um, and we don't really touch on this a lot, but like our deck plays one copy of Iona. I know we've discussed taking it out, but that's kind of there, like, as an early game to draw six, but if you can save that card to the late game against, like, Tina or against Lawstone, it's super strong to combo that, especially with Greninja. Uh, but, like, yeah, the other thing, too, with the Manaphy, like, why you don't have to bench it is Lost Tina is a lot slower than Lost Box. Like, they don't play Vacuum, like, they're not going to Flower Select as much. Um, so, normally, like, their turn two, like, you don't have to be scared about getting greninja so then you'll get a turn to evolve all your basics. And, obviously, Bidoof has Bench Barrier. Okay, so let's finish off here with Lost Box. I think this is the deck's worst matchup. I don't think it's, like, unwinnable. I just, like, I don't like sitting across from this. Um, especially if they go first, they go off to Sableye really quick. I think it's kind of hard to come back. Uh, why don't you walk us through how you think this matchup goes and what you can do as Chen Pao to try and win it. Yeah, this matchup is very scary. The, the reason why Chen Pao is so good is that it, it works really fast and it gets a lot of damage. Like it does a lot of damage, but that doesn't really matter when your opponent is equally as fast, if not faster, and all their attackers are one prizes. That can just like snipe off all your utility Pokemon. So it is really scary, especially if they like draw the nuts and hit the turn two Sableye. Even turn three is scary, but I think you cannot win against this match, but they hit turn two, turn three is winnable. I think honestly, um, 70 HP for it, you need it in this matchup. Without it, I think this would be a zero 100. Um, and you really, really need to hit the Greninja play. They don't have any uh, disruption, mostly, until maybe when you get down to three or less, because some lists play Roxanne. So you just have to, like, get use your Greninja as much as you can. Hope you have all four cross switches and Cancel Clones in your deck. You just have to try to hit it, like, if you hit it twice, you'll usually win. Yeah. But hitting it once might not be enough. Yeah, like, you need to hit it once just to, like, put the prize trade in your favor, because normally, like, your Chem Pals are trading. You're going to take two knockouts, they'll take one. Uh, or two turns to knock it out, and then, like you said, if you can Greninja twice, like, you're taking four prizes for, like, two. So you are going to win if that happens. Like, it's just, like, almost impossible to pull it off twice. Like, that's six cards, like, you're asking for none of them to be prized, drawing them at the right time, not discarding them. Um, yeah. So, uh, just to finish off here, like, I think let's look ahead a little bit. Like, 151's our next set. Uh, I think Peoria, Toronto Regions is going to have that. And we've seen some of the cards from Paradox Rift. So I just pulled out a couple that I think probably had the most potential in this deck. So I was just curious to get your thoughts. Uh, so the first one is Mew. What do you think about Mew EX? Um, I think this card is very inherently strong, but not in Chen Pao. I think uh, what people have noticed about this card is that the uh, really strong uh, use of it is to copy Greninja. So it forces a lot of one like decks that normally don't have to bench Manaphy to bench Manaphy. So like Guard War has bench Manaphy now if they put down Greninja. Lost Box have to push down Manaphy against like decks like Lugia that can actually use Mew. But we already have Greninja. And so we don't really need to copy Greninja, and we also have a Barrels. So both of the views, like best uses, are not very good in Chen Pao. We don't really need them. And it's, it's yeah. a fragile two prizer too, so yeah, I don't see a use for it. Yeah, I think I agree with you. To be honest, like it doesn't add anything to this deck that the stack's missing. Like we don't need more damage. Like we don't really need the card draw. Like we already have that. So and also like you only have bench space for this. Like if this is in play, like you probably can't have Chen Pao in play. Um, so if, like, other cards eventually come out, or, like, the meta shifts, like, maybe this card might have a use, but, like, yeah, I agree for now. Like, I don't think I'm going to put this in my deck. Cool, next up is the Iron Hands EX. Um, just for anyone who hasn't seen this card, the second attack is, if you take a knockout with it, you take one extra prize card. Uh, so I'm actually really excited about this card. I think this card 
could help solve a lot of Chen Pao's bad matchups, but uh, what do you think about this card? If you see me at Brazil, the Latin American International Championships, this card will be in my deck. I love <laughs> this card. It makes, it just feels so nice in Chen Pao. You can power it up very easily. And it just like, um, a lot of Chen Pao's weaknesses were just like, how are you going to like win the prize trade against next world one prizers? Yeah. But now you have this. And I know I, we complained a lot about the, you know, starting bad retreaters, having two retreaters. This is four retreat, <laughs> but I actually think the the payoff of having this card in your deck is actually so high that yeah. I'm willing to put it in my deck. Um, another thing is you have to play lightning energies. Tad bit annoying, but um, if you also didn't see, there's a new uh, item card coming out in the Paradox Rift set. It's I think it reads if you discard one card from your hand, search for two energies, yeah. which is already pretty good in normal Chen Pao. Uh, but to search for your lightning, so you can air to for it. So I actually think this card is actually really good, especially with cross switches. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really excited for this card. Like, I think this, like, almost solves Lost Box. Like, they cannot one-shot this back, like, unless they're putting a two project like a Dragonite into play. And at that point, you don't really care, because then you can just trade two back and forth. Um, also, just, like, random matchups. It makes your Gardevoir matchup, like, even better. Like, this just, like, accelerates the prize trade. Like, you can use it to take your last prize without needing to cross switcher. Um... Yeah, like, I just think the only drawback is, like, yeah, you have to get a lightning out of your deck. Um, but, like, with that item that we're talking about, like, it's kind of like a professor's ladder. Just, you get that lightning out once, and then once it's in your discard, you can just super energy retrieval for it, like, every single time. Um, so I'm really excited to try this card out. I think this has potential to really push Chen Pao up to, like, a tier 1 deck. This will farm Luminion. Yeah, farm the yeah, This ever, farms Luminion, yeah. If I want to ever put a Luminion deck, that's free three prizes instantly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cool. Well, that's all I had on Shen Pao. Um, Lucas, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, if you have any last thoughts, please feel free. Otherwise, just let people know where they can find you. Um, I think one thing we didn't actually touch upon, which is actually really important for the deck, is that our list plays two super rods. Mm, oh, yeah, let's is, talk about uh, that. Yeah, a complete nest. Oh, did we? No, I said let's I talk about it. I'm just going to pull the deck. <laughs> um, that is like one of the best cards in our deck, best inclusions of our deck. Two super rods is absolutely vital. People normally only run one, so people aren't expecting two, but you know, when your Baxcalibers are getting targeted, you need them. You can use it to use Greninja a lot. Um, the main utility we have from Super Rod is that it is basically free two energies because you'll Super Rod two energies back into your discard, from your discard to your deck, and then you can Shiver Chill it back into your hand. So yeah. a Super Rod plus a Superior Energy Retrieval will kill almost anything in play. It'll kill Zards, it'll kill UV Maxes, it'll kill Guardi VXs. So. It's very good. I think you have to be playing two super rods in this deck. Yeah, like I think um, even though our deck's like turbo, like I don't actually understand why the normal build of Chen Pao hasn't adopted this yet. Like I just normally see them playing ten energy, but it's like you said, like it's basically like energy retrieval plus Pokemon recovery if you need it. Um, also, we're playing Poke Stops, so, like you're gonna mill a bunch of Pokemon a lot, and it also just like lets you be more aggressive with your discards too. Um, yeah, I actually think it should be staple to the deck. Um, I still another thing like I didn't touch about a lot is the Iono. Um, so, like, looking at it, it kind of looks like it's there to, like, late game, like, kind of, like, make your opponent draw less. But, like, kind of, like, what I've been finding is, like, the deck is a little, like, struggles to set up in the early game. So, I actually just use it as, like, a fifth supporter. Like, it's, like, a draw six early. Because normally, like, by the time you get to the late game, like, you probably poke stopped it or you ultra balled it away. Um, but if you can hold it for the late game, like, it's a super strong card. Like, I guess Lost Box, like, I consciously, like, try and save it for the end. Because that is a way to come back. Um, yeah. Um, I'm very 50-50 on Iono. I can see why it's very strong. It's always nice to have disruption in your deck, just because it allows, like, without it, your opponent will just abuse, like, abuse that fact and just build a giant hand so they yeah. always have something they, like, always have what they need. So, um, it's very u it's useful for that sense, so that they, you can, like, they disrupt them, they can you can disable their plays. But what I found happened a lot is it would get Ultra Ball the way, it would get Superior yeah. Energy Retrieval the way, or it would get Pokestop the way. But I've heard a lot of great things about it from other people who played it, like Grant and Kieran who played it. But I'm very 50-50 on the card as of right now. Yeah, I agree. It's like one of those cards where it's like I'm only using it probably like once every 10 games. But like when I use it, I'm like, okay, like this card was actually like game saving. Um, so yeah, I'm on the fence about playing it as well. Um, the other card I guess we actually should have talked about including is why we don't play Luminion. Um, so like me personally, like we only play three Ultra Ball. And so like if I'm like Ultra Balling for like Luminion for an Irida, like early game like i just don't think i can afford to do that like i'm losing too many cards and then, like late game like i should be set up already so um that's why i don't really play luminion like i think it's a nice to have card 
Uh, like, what do you think about putting the minion in this deck? I think uh, it's really dumb. I think that card sucks, <laughs> personally. Uh, but people would be like, oh, you can Aqua turn it. But that, like, that just feels terrible. A lot of the times you just need, I'd be either be using Greninja or Chen Pao to be taking a big knockout, or Greninja to swing a prize trade. So taking a turn to uh, Luminion and Aqua return actually feels like a huge like setback to the deck. And I think that um, the benefit of it is like, sure, like if you go second, you can find a Irida. But like a lot of the time, your bench race is actually so tight yep. in this deck that you always want to be used, you always want two Fridger Backs, and you always want Greninja. So that's five slots already taken up. Yep. And the last one will usually be a Chen Pao. So there's like actually like no room for the many on your board. Yeah, I would agree with that too. Um, cool. Yeah, uh, I think that's all I have for my thoughts. Anything else? No, that's it. We covered, I think, most of it. Cool. All right, well, hopefully this guide was helpful for you guys. Uh, hopefully you can crush your local League Cups, League Challenges, your locals, and if you're taking this to a regionals, hopefully that goes well for you too. Um, Lucas, why don't you tell everybody where they can find you? So, you can follow me on Twitter, uh, at Zingod, uh, X-I-N-G-G-O-D. Um, and I actually just recently applied to Vetify, so when that gets uh, verified and processed, you can, you know, maybe if you need any champ help coaching, <laughs> hit me up on that. And I'd also like to thank my, uh, my sponsor, Team Daily Grind, they're amazing. Um, they support me a lot. The manager, Jerry, he's an amazing person, and I can't wait to do, do more with them this season. Nice. That's great to hear, man. Uh, cool. For me and myself, you can find me on Twitter at Kieran underscore TCG. Um, on YouTube, obviously, at Kieran TCG. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me on my Twitter or in the comments. I'll make sure to respond. Uh, but yeah, thanks for listening, and good luck out there.